Hi guys, last time I worked on my simple VGA circuit, I increased the vertical resolution from 100 pixels up to 480 pixels by adding video memory paging and a larger RAM chip. The time before, I doubled the horizontal resolution from 160 pixels to 320 pixels uh, by changing the output circuitry to output 2 pixels per memory read rather than just 1, and this came at the expense of reducing the colour depth to 2 bits per pixel. This time I'm going to double the horizontal resolution again to 640 pixels, but once again reduce the colour depth down to just one bit per pixel, that is black and white only. This is an important proof of concept showing that the timings are going to work at 640x480 before I expand the colour depth back up again. Before we dive into the changes needed in the circuit, here's a preview of the end result that we're shooting for. It's just the circles demo from last time. I haven't changed the software at all here, so it won't look right, but it is correctly rendering the bit patterns, even though they were originally drawn for a different output format. It's correctly rendering a 640x480 monochrome image without any bad artifacts. So let's now go back and see how I got here. So here's the breadboard from last time with the D flip-flop, the multiplexer which is connected through to the VGA output, and this orange wire driving the multiplexer from a clock signal delayed through some inverters. So that's a hex inverter IC and next to it is a quad NAND IC that's not actually doing anything anymore. And in the middle is the new four line buffer that I put in uh, in the last video to allow me to access more video memory by passing through more bank bits from the 6522's port B. Oh and before we go on I feel I ought to apologise or at least explain that I'm doing everything upside down here. As I'm working from the top end of the breadboard all the ICs will have their notches facing to the right not to the left which could be confusing for you guys so please bear that in mind if you're trying to follow which pin is which. Now what I'm going to do to get the resolution up to 640 horizontally is take the multiplexer out of the circuit again and replace it with a shift register. The multiplexer is only able to choose between two pixels uh, and output one of them. Uh, the shift register is actually an 8-bit shift register, it's a 74HCT166, so potentially this could choose between any of 8 pixels, although I'm only going to use four of them at the moment. And yeah, it's an 8-bit shift register with parallel input and asynchronous load. So it's sort of the opposite of a 595. For reference, I'll overlay the circuit diagram with the multiplexer and then with the shift register in place. So you should be able to see that whereas I was passing the bottom four bits of the latch to the multiplexer, I'm now going to pass those bits straight from the RAM to the shift register instead. Like I said, it's a parallel load shift register, so it can be initialized with eight bits of data in parallel, which it then shifts out serially one at a time. So immediately after we load it, the first pixel value will be output from pin 13, and then each time we shift it, a different pixel value will be output. And if we shift it too many times, we'll run out of pixels. We're only doing four pixels, so it'll start outputting the hardwired values from the lower bits. But I'm not going to shift it that many times before we reload it. In addition to the parallel inputs and clock, there's a clock enable pin, which I'll set to always be enabled, and a parallel enable pin, which causes the shift register to load from the parallel inputs instead of shifting on the next clock pulse. So this is a synchronous load, which is great, as it means all pixel transitions will occur in sync with the clock, whether they were due to loads or shifts. So let's get that wired up. Here's the ground, and I'm wiring clock enable to ground along with the bottom four input pins. Uh, the states of those don't really matter really, uh, but I need to connect them one way or another so that they're not floating. I'm going to skip over the clock on pin 7 for now. Power's power, obviously, and pin 9 over here also needs to be wired high, so this is an active low reset, which I'm not using for anything. And I'm going to wire the serial input high, I guess. It doesn't really matter again, uh, it just needs to not be floating. So the main remaining pins are pin 7, as I said before, which is the clock, and pin 15, which is the parallel enable and also the high parallel input bits I haven't connected through yet, and the output on pin 13. So let's deal with the output first. I'm disconnecting the red and blue outputs from the multiplexer and shorting them together at the output end where the resistor network is, so that we only have one output bit now, and the result will be white pixels. Then I'll thread this black wire through from there and connect it to pin 13 on the shift register. It's a bit tricky to get through, but that's nearly there, yep. Yeah. Mm, 
now for the parallel inputs and I'll use four rainbow ribbon connectors for these, uh, one for each pixel. And these are going to go to the parallel input bits on the shift register from the old D flip flops uh, own input pins, not its output pins. Uh, we want to load straight from the RAM here, not through the flip flop. Um, so I'm just connecting it here because the, the RAM is already connected through to this point and it's convenient. So now we just have the parallel load and clock remaining. Um, the clock is easy, it's just going to the 25.175 MHz crystal oscillator that's already driving everything. The only catch is that I might want to invert it. So I've wired it through to the inverter using this green wire. Uh, for now though I'll just connect the shift register clock to the green wire itself, not the inverted version, but it's there if I need it later on. Then finally, parallel enable. In theory we want this to go low briefly at the same point that the flip-flops clock goes high. I can't just wire it to the same signal though because the flip-flops clock input is low for too long. Uh, it's, it's low for a whole half of the cycle, so let's have a quick look at the timing diagram to see that. So here we have the 25 MHz clock, which I call clock 1, and it divided by 2 and 4. Over the course of four clock pulses, clock two and clock four together count from zero to three as a pair, and then reset. So they're kind of counting how far we are through each four pixel unit. For half of the four pixel cycle, the counters and RAM begin to output their data that will be valid for the next cycle, and towards the end of that period, the flip-flop latches in that data and holds it throughout the next cycle. So in theory, all I need to do is make the shift register's parallel enable go low for one tick at around the point where the flip-flop currently latches new data from RAM. However, it's not that easy to deduce exactly how to do that because there are actually mistakes in the way these timings are currently generated. I'm not entirely sure why it actually works at the moment given what I've found, and I really need to go back and fix the issues there. However, I don't want to do that now. So what I'm going to do at the moment is connect the parallel enable pin to the NAND of clock 2 and clock 4 and see what happens. And if it's not at the correct point in the cycle, then I'll experiment with inverting either of those uh, before they go into the NAND to change which point in the cycle that that will occur at, and potentially with inverting the actual shift register's clock input as well, uh, which will change its face slightly too. So this is not a scientific approach, but it should be at least revealing and hopefully work as a proof of concept, and I can come back and figure out the proper timing better later on. So back on the breadboard, the orange wire here is clock 2, uh, with a couple of inverters hooked up, and the black wire is clock 4 with more inverters, so that's all, that's all good and ready to go. Uh, we don't need this long orange wire anymore, that was just there to drive the uh, multiplexer before, but we're not using that now, so let's get that out of the way. And as discussed, I'm going to hook clock 4 up to a NAND gate and clock 2 as well, uh, both uninverted. Um, and I'll connect the output of that NAND gate to the shift register's parallel enable input on pin 15, I think. And I think that should be everything, so let's see what happens and uh, see if we need to make any changes. So turning the power on, I'm getting a proper signal, which is great, and a white screen, which is also correct for this program. Let's get the camera up there so you can see. And I can click through the usual sequence that we've seen before. We have the test lines. The whole screen test pattern looks remarkably good for a first go. Uh, that bitmap I made a while ago is up there too. Each colour in the bitmap is showing up as a different kind of stripey pattern. And in the end, the random drawing test is running. I can see some artefacts, though, in the area at the bottom that should be stable. So there is definitely a timing issue here. So going back to the line test, uh, there's something definitely wrong at the left edge of the screen. It's not clocking in the first pixels correctly there. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. It looks like some repetition. And the test pattern here looks fine, but it's very repetitive already, so it's not a good test of that. Um, the random rights test is also showing some duplication in the first two four pixel columns here, um, for sure, and a lot of random flickering in the lower half of the screen likely occurring again when the CPU is writing to the video RAM. So I'm going to try inverting one of the clock inputs to that NAND gate. Let's do that. And that seems to have fixed the duplication issue, but not the corruption during writes. Um, so I'll invert the other one too, and these, this is to change the point during the cycle at which we actually sample the RAM. 
So I'll try inverting the other one too. And now that's looking a lot better. So there's no corruption during writes now and no duplication in the first columns either. So let's go back to the line test then. And that issue at the left hand side of the screen is fixed now. Uh, the jagginess of the line is to be expected. Uh, it's due to how I'm drawing it. So the code is still trying to draw it at two bits per pixel with the bits for each pixel uh, interleaved with each other. So the first memory location there at the top left of the line is holding the bit pattern 1010, uh, which would be a white pixel on the left in the uh, two bit per pixel mode. And the one below it holds 0101, which would be a white pixel on the right in the two, two bit per pixel mode. Uh, and then below that and to the right it just repeats 1010, zero, zero, then 0101 zero, zero, one, and, and so on. Um, but in this mode that uh, shows up as this sort of jaggy pattern. I'll try and overlay a graphic that might explain that better. So the test pattern really shows that the 16 uh, distinct combinations of 4 bits are all actually showing up correctly. Uh, you can see a binary count up going on there quite clearly. And as I said, in the bitmap at the top of the screen, each colour in the bitmap now comes out as a different stripey pattern, which looks kind of neat. You can still sort of read what it says, but I ought to dig up a proper monochrome image, really, or make one. And just to confirm the changes I made on the breadboard while you were looking at the monitor, notice that the NAND gate on the left here is now connected to the inverter outputs on the right, uh, rather than directly to the clock lines like it was before. That's the only change I made to fix those those artifact issues for now. And here's the other test program now with the circles. Again, I haven't changed the code at all, so it looks all stripy, uh, but we're getting a good full screen 640 by 480 image for sure. Uh, the text is wrong, of course. I ought to update the program to know it's running in 640 by 480 uh, and only use black and white for the circles, but I don't want to actually make any software changes right now because uh, it's not completely trivial and I might just need to do it again differently when I add colour back in. But that's it for now. Uh, this has been a good proof of concept. It works, but it's exposed an issue with the timings that I would like to solve properly, um, as it'll be more reliable in the long run if I do that. Um, and that's what the proof of concept's really for, is to expose that kind of problem. I might not do that on camera, though, unless you really want to see it, uh, because it will probably be kind of a repeat of things I've already talked about before. Also, of course, for now, this is just black and white, one bit per pixel, with no colour or shades of grey. Adding that back in isn't very hard. It will mostly involve more shift registers and more memory. Uh, and I'll probably separate the image data from the sync data at long last to get that out of the way as well. Crucially, though, it won't involve changing the timing or anything like that, uh, and that's the hard part to get right here. It's also going to mean the poor 6502 has much more memory to update every time it draws something, which is going to start becoming a problem. Back in the 8-bit days, on the BBC Micro at least, most games only ran at about 160 by 256 and 320 by 256 was considered high resolution. Uh, 640 by 256 was also supported, but wasn't really used for any games that I can remember. Uh, it was just too expensive to have so much video memory, and uh, in, uh, both in terms of how much RAM it used and how much RAM the CPU had to update. A lot of games actually used smaller windows within the overall display, and that was both to reduce the amount of RAM needed uh, for video memory, and also again to reduce the amount of bandwidth needed to make things move. I am running the 6502 at three times the speed of the one in the BBC Micro, uh, which will certainly help, um, but ultimately what I think I want to do is implement some hardware acceleration to take some of the burden off the 6502 and make certain critical operations be much faster. I was thinking of making a whole video going over what matters and why from a game developer's perspective, because uh, then we can design the hardware to make those operations as cheap as we can for this CPU. And there are also a lot of other operations we could easily add support for, like uh, hardware scrolling and things like that. Um, and some things that might seem simple but are deceptively harder than you'd expect, I think, like hardware palettes I've been thinking about a bit as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things that we can we can also add there. And also, anyway, lots of exciting things coming up. I'm definitely looking forward to working on those. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys are too. As always, I'd love to hear in the comments what you thought of this. If there's anything in particular you're interested in or looking forward to, do let me know. And I'll see you all next time.